Hashtag Detroit Did You Know. Altercations between youth started on June 20, 1943, on a warm Sunday evening on Belle Isle, an island in the Detroit River off Detroit's mainland. In what is considered a communal disorder, youths fought intermittently through the afternoon. The brawl eventually grew into a confrontation between groups of whites and blacks on the Long Belle Isle Bridge, crowded with more than 100,000 day trippers returning to the city from the park. From there the riot spread into the city. Sailors joined fights against blacks. The riot escalated in the city after a false rumor spread that a mob of whites had thrown a black mother and her baby into the Detroit River. Blacks looted and destroyed white property as retaliation. Whites overran Woodward to Varon where they proceeded to tip over 20 cars that belonged to black families. The whites also started to loot stores while rioting. Historian Marilyn S. Johnson argues that this rumor reflected black male fears about historical white violence against black women and children. An equally false rumor that blacks had raped and murdered a white woman on the Belle Isle Bridge swept through white neighborhoods. Angry mobs of whites spilled onto Woodward Avenue near the Roxy Theater around 4 a.m. in the actual area of Brush Park beating blacks as they were getting off streetcars on their way to work. They also went to the black neighborhood of Paradise Valley, one of the oldest and poorest neighborhoods in Detroit, attacking black civilians who were trying to defend their homes. Blacks attacked white-owned businesses. The clashes soon escalated to the point where mobs of whites and blacks were assaulting one another, beating innocent motorists, pedestrians and streetcar passengers, burning cars, destroying storefronts and looting businesses. Both sides were said to have encouraged others to join in the riots with false claims that one of their own had been attacked unjustly. Blacks were outnumbered by a large margin, and suffered many more deaths, personal injuries and property damage. Out of the 34 people killed, 24 of them were black. The riots lasted three days and ended only after Mayor Jeffries and Governor Harry Kelly asked President Franklin Roosevelt to intervene. He invoked the Insurrection Act of 1807 and ordered in federal troops. A total of 6,000 troops imposed a curfew, restored peace and occupied the streets of Detroit. Over the course of three days of rioting, 34 people had been killed, 25 were African Americans, of which 17 were killed by the police, their forces were predominantly white and dominated by ethnic whites. 13 deaths remain unsolved. Nine deaths reported were white, and out of the 1,800 arrests made, 85% of them were black, and 15% were white. Of the approximately 600 persons injured, more than 75% were black people. The first casualty was a white civilian who was struck by a taxi. Later, four young white males shot and killed a 58-year-old black civilian, Moses Kiska, who was sitting at the bus stop. A doctor then went to a house call in a black neighborhood. He then was hit in the back of the head with a rock and beaten to death by black rioters. A couple years after the riot, a monument was dedicated to this doctor at the streets of East Grand Boulevard and Gratchet Avenue. After the riot, leaders on both sides had explanations for the violence, effectively blaming the other side. White city leaders, including the mayor, blamed young black hoodlums and persisted in framing the events as being caused by outsiders, people who were unemployed and marginal. Mayor Jeffrey said, Negro hoodlums started it, but the conduct of the police department, by and large, was magnificent. The Wayne County prosecutor believed that leaders of the NAACP were to blame as instigators of the riots. Governor Kelly called together a fact-finding commission to investigate and report on the causes of the riot. Its mostly white members blamed black youths, unattached, uprooted, and unskilled misfits within an otherwise law-abiding black community, and regarded the events as an unfortunate incident. They made these judgments without interviewing any of the rioters, basing their conclusions on police reports, which were limited. Other officials drew similar conclusions, despite discovering and citing facts that disproved the thesis. Dr. Lowell S. Selling of the Recorder's Court Psychiatric Clinic conducted interviews with 100 black offenders. He found them to be employed, well-paid, long-standing, of at least 10 years, residents of the city, with some education and a history of being law-abiding. He attributed their violence to their southern heritage. This view was repeated in a separate study by Elmer R. Akers and Vernon Fox, sociologist and psychologist, respectively, at the State Prison of Southern Michigan. Although most of the black men they studied had jobs and had been in Detroit an average of more than 10 years, Akers and Fox characterized them as unskilled and unsettled. They stressed the men's southern heritage as predisposing them to violence. Additionally, a commission was established to determine the cause of the riot. Despite the unequal amount of violence toward blacks, the commission blamed the riot on blacks and their community leaders. 
Detroit's black leaders identified numerous other substantive causes, including persistent racial discrimination in jobs and housing, frequent police brutality against blacks and the lack of black representation on the force, and the daily animosity directed at their people by much of Detroit's white population. Following the violence, Japanese propaganda officials incorporated the event into its materials that encouraged black soldiers not to fight for the United States. They distributed a flyer titled Fight Between Two Races. The Axis powers publicized the riot as a sign of Western decline. Racial segregation in the United States armed forces was ongoing, and the response to the riots hurt morale in African American units, most significantly the 1,511th Quartermaster Truck Regiment, whose black enlisted men fought against white officers and military police on June 24 while stationed in England, in the Battle of Babber Bridge, after the officers and MPs attempted to enforce Jim Crow laws on a pub in the village where locals welcomed the black GIs. Walter White, head of the NAACP, noted that there was no rioting at the Packard and Hudson plants, where leaders of the UAW and CIO had been incorporating blacks as part of the rank and file. These changes in the defense industry were directed by executive order by President Roosevelt and had begun to open opportunities for blacks. According to the Detroit News, future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, then with the NAACP, assailed the city's handling of the riot. He charged that police unfairly targeted blacks while turning their backs on white atrocities. He said 85% of those arrested were black while whites overturned and burned cars in front of the Roxy Theater with impunity as police watched. This weak need policy of the police commissioner coupled with the anti-Negro attitude of many members of the force helped to make a riot inevitable. Reinterpretation in 1990. A late 20th century analysis of the facts collected on the arrested rioters has drawn markedly different conclusions. It notes that the whites who were arrested were younger, generally unemployed, and had traveled long distances from their homes to the black neighborhood to attack people there. Even in the early stage of the riots near Bellaw Bridge, white youths traveled in groups to the riot area and carried weapons. Later in the second stage, whites continued to act in groups and were prepared for action, carrying weapons and traveling miles to attack the black ghetto along its western side at Woodward Avenue. Blacks who were arrested were older, often married and working men, who had lived in the city for 10 years or more. They fought closer to home, mainly acting independently to defend their homes, persons or neighborhood, and sometimes looting or destroying mostly white-owned property there in frustration. Where felonies occurred, whites were more often arrested for use of weapons, and blacks for looting or failing to observe the curfew imposed. Whites were more often arrested for misdemeanors. In broad terms, both sides acted to improve their positions. The whites fought out of fear, the blacks fought out of hope for better conditions. Related Stories 1967 Detroit Riot Detroit Race Riot of 1863 Harlem Riot of 1943 List of Incidents of Civil Unrest in the United States Hashtag Our Struggle Continues And a lot of them got in trouble because they were trying to take advantage of the situation. How old were you in the 1943 riot? How old were you? He was about 20. It's a 40, 1943 riot. <laughs> I was born in 1937. So the riot in 1943 was just a rumor. That's right. It started. That's, a rumor that's where it started. It happened, but it triggered it. The school said, said blacks should attack some whites. The whites went back and said blacks attacked them, and, and, and blacks went back and said whites attacked them. Was that the incident that they supposed that threw a baby overboard right. at Bill Isle or something? That was a riot based upon race. Right. Right. Yeah, it was hostility. I mean, blacks were right. relegated. You know, we didn't have, we could combine, we lived in two other, sections. The riot, the riot in 67 was about what? About getting even, or getting what they could get, taking advantage of a situation. So, power to the people. The people was just so fed up at the time. They were taking advantage of a situation. Something happened. Right there. Right there. They took advantage of it. Was it something um, that the government did, or no? Racism. No, no, no. 